Hey everybody, it's Pastor Joel here at Four Winds Assembly of God Church, and we are ready to continue our series through the book of Revelation. So if you've been following with us on our YouTube channel, this is going to be week number 15 in our series. We've been going through, trying to go through about a chapter a week. Now our pace at the beginning was quite a bit slower as we spent seven whole weeks looking at the seven churches of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And then we picked up the pace, taking a couple chapters a week, and now we're back to what I usually try to keep things to, about a chapter a week. What we're going to get into today, I'm entitling this message, Meanwhile, on Planet Earth. We are going to continue something that we started last week when we got into Revelation chapter 12. But before we get really into the Word, let's open up with a word of prayer. Let's ask God to speak to our hearts, because in this passage, we're going to find you know, several things that might be really interesting. But what we really need to discover is, God, what are you saying to me today? And how can I apply this to my life? And so let's look to the Lord in prayer and let's ask him to illuminate the scriptures and show us what our right now application is for his word. So Father God, we thank you. Thank you for equipping us with the Bible. We thank you for giving us instruction. Lord, I pray that you would cause your word to come alive in our hearts. I ask for your anointing to preach and to teach your word so that it would come alive and that we would be equipped by your instruction and that we might become the people that are ready for you to come for us whenever you come for us, however you choose to come for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. As always, I like to uh, remind people that in the description of the video, there is a link that you can download the notes that we use in our auditorium. When we're we're doing this live, we uh, give everybody a set of those notes. You can take them home. It's not really something you need during the teaching, uh, but it is basically a synopsis of the of the material that we're going to cover today. And then at the end, there's some application questions and some homework. I think that is a really good uh, devotional that you can use throughout the week before our next broadcast. So here we are, Revelation chapter 13. As I said, this is message number 15, and we're calling this Meanwhile on Planet Earth. The book Revelation, as I like to remind everyone, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's an unveiling of who he is and what he has done, and we're catching a glimpse of what he is going to do. And we're going to see some things about Jesus Christ in this particular teaching that... um, uh, we're going to look at him and maybe in a way that you wouldn't expect to see him, but even in, when the, uh, the enemies of Christ are exposed and unveiled, even in that, we catch a glimpse of who Jesus is. And that's, that's really remarkable, and that's something you really want to uh, bear in mind as we get into the topic today. Well, let's just review very quickly because what we're going to build on today, it it jumps right off of where we left off last time. We surveyed Revelation chapter 12 last week, which is the vision of the woman and the dragon. It's using symbolic language. And so this vision of the woman and the dragon, it's, it's a really cool chapter. It's probably my favorite chapter to teach through in the book of Revelation because it combines history from a distant past and it weaves it together with events that are on our near horizon, and it ties together so many loose threads from across the breadth of Scripture. And so uh, in this particular vision, Israel is depicted as a pregnant woman. Now, if you've read a commentary or heard a teaching that gave a different viewpoint, I'll refer you back to the last message. You can look at the last video in our series, and uh, you'll see why I've arrived at this particular conclusion. Jesus, I believe, is depicted as her son, and then Satan, the dragon, uh, is, uh, that, that's probably the easiest one to interpret. Satan is uh, conclusively, without question, depicted as the dragon. Scripture just comes right out and says it. The other two are a little bit trickier to unravel, perhaps. I think they're pretty easy, uh, but, uh, you know, that's, the, the red dragon is probably the easiest one to come to the conclusion. That's going to be important because that's also going to be something we're going to need to keep in mind as we explore Revelation 13. Now, in Revelation 12, what we find is an epic story that that, uh, takes elements that we find at the very beginning of the Bible. If you go back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, what do you find? You You have a woman having an interaction with a serpent. And so here in Revelation 12, you have the woman who is is a portrayal of Israel. And then you have the dragon who is also, it's clarified that he is the devil and Satan, the serpent of old. And so what began in Eden, it builds to a climax. That's one of the things we find in Revelation 12. 
We also discover that Satan is permanently expelled from heaven, and that's going to play into our story today. Cast to the earth, he makes it his business to destroy the Israeli remnant, and that's one of the uh, the the that's one of the storylines that you find spread throughout Scripture. I, I listed over forty scriptures in last week's notes that uh, uh, have something to do with this particular topic. Revelation 12 goes on to show how God's going to intervene and protect the Israeli remnant in the end times, and all that's very interesting. But then you have to approach the, okay, so what? Why does this matter? Well, we explored that last week at the end of the message. It turns out the return of Jesus Christ has a very important prerequisite condition. And that might be surprising to people based on maybe how you've heard the Bible taught. Some people have this myopic view of the return of Christ. And so it turns out the return of Jesus Christ, there is a prerequisite condition. It's laid out in several scriptures. The two key ones I would put up front of all the others is Hosea 5.15 and Jesus' own words in Matthew 23, 37 to 39. He said, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that is a statement from Psalm 118 that proclaims the Messiah as the King of Israel. And there's an important application for our lives there, that we won't really see Jesus for who he really is until he's the King of our life. Well, now we're going to get into Revelation chapter 13, where it, it's going to pick up using the same style and uh, the same storyline that we were unpacking in Revelation chapter 12. In our story of Revelation 13, we're going to encounter two new symbolic characters. Two more important end times characters might be another way of putting it. In between Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 17, we find seven characters portrayed using symbolic language, heavily uh, using symbolic language. Now, I believe that these are real characters. Some of them represent a nation, some represent an individual person, some a government and an individual person. Uh, but uh, we find seven characters portrayed in that passage. We're going to find characters numbers five and six today. And so we're going to look at these in sequence. But before we do, the Bible speaks about one character, one person. Let me be specific about this. One person is talked about in the Bible more than any other. Now, who is this? Now, to our live auditorium, I said, now, if you can't answer that question, you're not going to heaven, okay? <laughs> so this one should be pretty obvious. Obviously, it's Jesus Christ, right? The Bible talks about Jesus more than any other person, bar none. And when you run into stuff, especially in the Old Testament, that don't make sense, try plugging Jesus into the middle of the equation and see what happens. A lot of times, that's going to unravel the mystery. Well, after Jesus, and we set him aside, okay, Jesus is talked about more in the Bible than anyone else, any other person, Who's, who, who comes in second place? And it turns out that's kind of surprising. I, uh, I did a study of this many years ago. Jesus, coming on close to 20 years ago, I did this study. Uh, I exhaustively began to examine in the Bible where this character shows up. Um, the character I'm referring to is the person that we typically refer to as the Antichrist coming world leader. And uh, so I, I did a survey of the scriptures from, from Genesis to Revelation exhaustively. Every time I ran across something I even thought might be a reference to him, I started to mark it out and, and, and run this down. And uh, I, have to, uh, I have to agree with Arthur W. Pink, whose classic study on this got me thinking along these lines, that uh, he definitely is talked about more than people give credit. So we're only actually going to look at a slice of this person, of what the Bible says about this person in today's message. But I want you to understand, he's talked about extensively throughout Scripture. In Revelation chapter 13, it's going to consolidate our understanding of this coming world leader. So let's go ahead and look at this. Revelation 13, we're going to divide it into two parts from verses 1 to 10. We're going to look at the beast from the sea. Now again, symbolic language is going to be used here. We're not talking about some monster that's going to come out of the ocean and take over the world. We're talking about a government and a person, and I'm going to show you some scriptures that will help to uh, uh, maybe help you understand why I arrive at that conclusion. The first ten verses of Revelation 13 it introduces us to this fifth character in our sevenfold cast of characters in Revelation, and uh, what we find here is the beast from the sea. Revelation 13.1, there are some variations between Bible translations here. I'm using the New American Standard 95 edition, and I believe that this really is the, the accurate, I think, the understanding that we were meant to take from this. 
It says, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. A lot of people believe that, there's these theologians that believe that that particular sentence actually belongs to the ending of Revelation chapter 12, and I would be inclined to agree with that, but it does help us to become aware of that there really shouldn't be any gap between the two chapters. It's one continuous flow of narrative here. So we're continuing the story from Revelation 12, but now we've entered a new phase and a new focus. So Satan stands on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, or crowns, rulership crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. If you were to read Revelation 13 without any other chapters of the Bible, this would probably be very difficult to unravel. This passage is actually best understood in the light of what it says in Daniel chapter 7. Now, last week I gave everyone a homework assignment. I don't know if anyone actually does these things or not, but this is where Daniel 7 would be useful. I, I told everyone last week, read Daniel 7 and read Revelation 13, read those two chapters and read them back to back and see how they help one another. Uh, what, what one is perhaps lacking, the other chapter kind of fills in some of those gaps. Daniel saw a vision of four different beasts arising from the Mediterranean region. I don't have time to take you through and do a full exegesis of uh, Daniel chapter 7 in this message, so I'm just going to very briefly summarize it. Daniel 7.17 7, helps us to understand what these four beasts that he sees in this vision coming up out of the sea signify. What, what are these symbols representing? Verse 17, Daniel is told that these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings. And I put in brackets kingdoms because the, the, the Aramaic word that's used there can be used in both senses. And I think both senses are intended for us. Uh, I think we're, it's intended for us to receive them as both representing a kingdom and its head of state. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go. So the term there can be applied in both directions, or it, it can be both simultaneously. Four kings or kingdoms that will rise from the earth. So that's what these four beasts represent. Each beast represents a Gentile, read that non-Israeli, non-Jewish kingdom that gains sovereignty over Jerusalem. That's why it's these four and only these four across the scope of history, only these four have gained sovereignty over Jerusalem during a very specific period of time. Okay? The winged lion represents Babylon, with uh, its, its chief ruler at the beginning is Nebuchadnezzar. So the winged lion is Nebuchadnezzar and his successors of Babylon. The bear represents the Persian Empire under Cyrus and his successors. The winged leopard represents the Macedonian Empire under Alexander the Great and his successors. All right, so now we come across this fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel struggles to describe him. See in verse 7, I, after this, I kept looking in the night visions. These, these four beasts, they come up in sequence. There's a chronology, okay? First the lion, then the bear, then the leopard. Okay, after this, I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth, and it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. So right off the bat, we see similarity here uh, between what we're seeing in Daniel 7 and what we just read about in Revelation 13. This fourth beast, it represents the Roman Empire, and it does so in two phases. And, and what you find in Daniel 7 is a retelling of what you find in Daniel chapter 2. So if you really want to chase this down, read Daniel chapter 2. It's a, it's a longer chapter, but the same material is covered, only the symbols, it, it, it's a metallic statue. Uh, that, that is depicted in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 7, these four kingdoms are four beasts. In Daniel 2, they are four different kinds of metals in that statue. So the fourth beast, we see this as representing the Roman Empire in two phases. Phase 1 being the phase that existed when Jesus was on the earth, when the book of Revelation was written. In other words, the ancient Roman Empire. A revived Roman Empire is what some theologians like to refer to when we talk about a coming government that does not, at this present moment when this is being recorded, exist. Okay, so this is there's a revived version of this empire that's going to exist on the earth, and it's going to be the predominant political power on the earth in the time when Jesus physically returns to earth to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. So this fourth beast represents the Roman Empire. 
Now, I want to compare Daniel chapter 7 with Daniel 13, because I believe that what John is describing in, in uh, Revelation 13 is a more detailed version of what Daniel was struggling to describe in Daniel 7. So check this out. Revelation 13, 1, let's look at it again. It says, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. Okay, look at verse 2. The beast I saw was like a leopard. He had a body structure like a leopard. Its feet were like those of a bear. Its mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, Satan, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. As in Daniel, this beast, it represents two things simultaneously, I believe. I believe it represents both a political entity and its political leadership, its head of state. Example of that, we use this all the time in, in, in our culture. We will sometimes refer to the United States by the name of our president, whoever that happens to be at that moment. We might say, you know, President Bush did this or that. President Clinton did this or that. I'm dating myself now. You might say President Obama or whatever. We, we, we say they did something, but what in reality what we're saying is the United States government did something. Okay, so that's, that's a common way of expressing things even in our own time. So I believe this beast, it represents both the government, the regime, and its political leadership as embodied in one specific person. Now, when he says from the sea, some people see that as, as idiomatic as from the sea of humanity. In other words, he comes from a multitude of nations, uh, different ethnic backgrounds may be in view here. In other words, not Israeli, not Jewish. And they're probably right about that. But I think there's another sense that we need to explore that is also true. And I believe that from the sea refers to the Mediterranean region, Southern Europe, or the Middle East. I think, and I think Daniel really, it's, it's my understanding of the passages in Daniel, not just chapter 7, but chapter 8, uh, that caused me to arrive at that particular interpretation. The initial description of this beast is almost identical to what we find in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. Remember the seven heads, the ten horns, the crowns, all that? Well, Revelation 12, 9 conclusively identifies the dragon as being the devil and Satan. We've already established that. Okay, so what we got here is, in this description of this beast, it tells us here, when it com when it it's trying to describe this, this coming world leader and his, his government. He's using the same terms that the Bible used to describe Satan. It tells us that there's a satanic nature to this beast that we're reading about in Revelation 13. In other words, it's government, it's culture, it's personnel, the leading personality of that government, that regime, its head of state. All of these are being heavily influenced by Satan. That's something we need to, that, that's, I'm taking a lot of time in the beginning of this just to make sure we understand that. The significance of the heads, the horns, you know, the seven heads, the ten horns, and the crowns, we're going to wait until Revelation 17 to uh, uh, interpret that because the scripture is going to give us the details we need in that segment to uh, make some sense of these symbols. So we're just going to put that on the shelf for now. We'll come back to it later. But for now, I just want us to make sure we fully understand that this coming government and again, it's a government that I don't believe exists currently in its final form. That this coming government will, there will be a heavily satanic nature to it. And its head of state will be heavily influenced by Satan. Just how much so, we'll see in just a couple of verses here. He says that beast was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear. The mouth was like the mouth of a lion. Something I'd like to point out here is each of those descriptives um, each of those descriptions, they are describing something of these predecessor kingdoms, namely Babylon, Persia, Macedonians. And it's describing the strongest part of that particular animal. And so like the leopard, his body structure, that's his greatest asset, the paw of the bear, the jaws of the lion. And so how I interpret this is that this coming government, this coming regime will have the strongest attributes of the, per, of the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Macedonians. Now, that's something you'll have to track down all on your own. It's way beyond the scope of what we're going to cover today, but I just thought I would point that out here. It says, The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So the essence of this final earthly empire is its satanic character. 
the government, its head of state. They derive their power and authority from Satan personally. Now, you'll recall from Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 12, that at about this time, Satan has been cast down to the earth. You, you'll recall that you know, he lost his ability to present himself before heaven, and somehow he's lost dimensionality, and he's stuck now in our world in some way. I believe that Satan is going to be far more personally active on the earth during these final three and one half years as a result of having lost that war in heaven that we read about in Revelation chapter 12. I don't believe that war has taken place yet. At least in this time. Let me clarify. What we're reading in Scripture by Revelation 13, that war has, has happened. But right now, where I'm sitting here in the year 2023, I don't believe that that has happened yet. Confined to the earth, Satan is expressing himself. We're going to find this in this chapter very clearly, that he's going to be expressing himself through the agency of the most significant political power on the earth. He's going to use a government that can link its heritage all the way back to the old Roman Empire. And I put some scriptures on your screen so you can kind of run this down and see why I've arrived at that conclusion. He uses the body and the personality of that government's head of state. That's what we're going to explore a little bit more today. Look at verse 3. It says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon, Satan. There's satanic worship going on now because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? It says his fatal wound was healed. Now, some people take that to mean the government, that this that signifies the revival of this old Roman Empire, and everyone's amazed that this thing has come back to life in some way. That may be true, but I think it can also be said that this applies to a very specific person. I believe that there is a personal aspect to this, and I think this is actually referring to the head of state more than the state itself. This person, we typically refer to him as the Antichrist, which I don't think is the best title for him. It's only used a couple times in scriptures. It's not the most common title of him, but it's the one that people are most familiar with. So for the sake of um, making sure that we're all on the same page and talking about the same thing, I'm going to continue to use that label. This person experiences, I believe, some form of resurrection or a parody of it. I believe he receives a fatal head wound. And that he, if he does not actually die, he, it, it so much looks like he's dead that the world believes him to have resurrected. So whether he actually resurrects from the dead in a parody of Jesus, or whether people just think he rose from the dead is immaterial. The, the point is, at the end of the day, everyone thinks it happens. So uh, I think that that is the, uh, really the essence of it. So it's possible he, he, he is just uh, resuscitated and not necessarily resurrected. So you'll read some, some people have different views on that. The point is that people believe he, ris he rises from the dead. And I think that that's what Revelation eleven seven 7 was referring to, and it calls him the beast that comes up out of the abyss. Okay, there, in some capacity, he comes up out of the abyss. Well, what does that mean? You know, I, I think that it's referring to this, this uh, if not a total death experience, then a near-death experience as a result of a fatal head wound. The result on the earth is that people worship the dragon. They end up worshiping Satan. What, now, whether they knowingly really realize that or not is unclear, but they ultimately end up worshiping Satan because he gives his authority to the beast. So the, this world leader and his regime become a proxy for Satan. And through the worship of this man, Satan is going to receive what he craves most. Recognition, attention, and ultimately to be worshipped. Now let me just step back for a second here, and I want you to consider this. When we talk about something that's satanic, a lot of times our mind goes to a place where we think something satanic, that must be, you know, someone's got pentagrams painted on the floor in their basement, and there's probably goat horns up, and, and some skulls, and candles, and chanting, and that sort of thing. In reality, what, would we, what do we see in Scripture? What is Satan really after? He wants recognition. He wants attention. He wants to be worshipped as though he is co-equal with God. And it makes me wonder, how many times do we do exactly the same thing and not realize that that, is, that particular activity ultimately 
is satanic. That's something I, I want us to recognize. What, what makes something satanic? A lot of times it's maybe not what we really think. Maybe what, something that makes something satanic is when it diverges from what God has said and is appropriating, appropriating unto us, when we take something unto us that belongs to God. So let's just kind of consider that as we explore a little bit further. And I want you to pay attention to the importance of worship in this entire chapter. Okay, that's going to be important toward the end. So under the influence of Satan, this character, the, or, or this, this person, the beast, his character, who he really is at his core, it's actually going to mirror that of Satan. He's going to be deeply satanic in his character. There's going to be some ways he's very much like Christ in some ways, but his character is going to be opposed to Christ. This person is going to crave recognition, crave attention. He will want to be worshipped. He might put on a show of, you know, feigning that he really doesn't want this, but at the, at the end of the day, this is what he really wants. Just as Jesus reveals the Father, the beast reveals the dragon. So if you want to understand the character of Satan, look at the character of this guy that we call the Antichrist. As we explore this passage, it's important to note how, as I said, in some ways, this guy's going to be, he's going to appear very Christ-like. So there's areas where we're going to be able to compare him to Jesus, but his character is going to be the opposite of Jesus. And we just need to be aware of that. Just look at the figurative language of how they're, they're portrayed in Scripture. Jesus is portrayed as a lamb, and he's got horns and he's got crowns. And this is in Revelation 5, using symbolic language, okay? Antichrist is portrayed as a beast. He's got horns and he's got crowns. So there are some similarities. The lamb is seen as if he had been slain. This beast here receives a fatal head. So there's, there's similarities, but there's clear-cut differences. It says in verse 5, There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth and blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name, his, care, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Now, who would that be? Who's in heaven that he would be bad-mouthing? Maybe a whole lot of people that just up and vanished some time before this guy comes to power. Just a thought. Could also be the two witnesses that resurrected as well. We saw that in Revelation chapter 11. So there's, there's a number of things that we could put perhaps in that category. But I think the key point to explore here is the most dominant characteristic of this person we call Antichrist is his mouth. His most dominant characteristic is that he, this guy, every time he shows up, he's running his mouth. And we see some examples of this. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 provides us with a really good example. Daniel eleven thirty six 36 says, The king will do as he pleases. He's going to do whatever he wants. And he's going to exalt and magnify himself above every god. Everything. He, he puts himself above everything else. This is the pinnacle of selfishness, right? He will exalt and magnify himself above every god. He will speak monstrous things against the god of gods, and he will prosper until the indignation or that time of tribulation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. Now you're going to find this across scripture. That is his most dominant characteristic is how he runs his mouth. It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Somehow he gains control, a measure of control, over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. And what woos them more than anyone else, anything else, what, what impresses people more than anything else, is that this guy was dead, or at least they thought he was dead, received a fatal head wound, and came back to life. Who can make war with this guy? It says he was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, which is another reason why I don't believe the church is on the earth when, this, when these events transpire, because Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. And yet here we find this guy clearly under the power of Satan, having victorious war over the saints and overcoming them. And so let's, uh, let's just continue to read on verse 8. It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Say all. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. 
If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and faith of the saints. All right, so seven things are actually given to this man according to this passage. We find another group of sevens here, by the way. His power, his throne, his great authority, mouth-speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, authority to act out his satanic impulses for three and a half years, or 42 months. Remember, 42 months is an expression of three and a half years. The time period immediately preceding Jesus' return is a seven-year period of time, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. So we're at the halfway mark of that seven-year period. This guy is going to be under the control of Satan for that final 42 months, and he's going to have the authority to act out those impulses. Basically, Satan's using this guy as a proxy. And, uh, and this has happened before, by the way. It says that the devil entered into Judas Iscariot before he betrays Jesus. So something very similar taking place here in the future. He's going to be able to wage victorious war on the saints, whoever that is. I believe that those are believers. Those are people who have decided to follow Jesus under the influence of preaching from the two witnesses from Revelation 11 or the 144,000 from Revelation chapter 7. Uh, but these are people that have come to faith in Jesus during this time period. Authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. By the way, you won't find the word church anywhere in this segment of Revelation. And I believe that's another clue that the church is gone. It talks about the church quite a lot in chapters 2 and 3. And then from chapter 4, nothing about it. Just, it refers to saints, but not the church. And I think that that's um, another indication of my viewpoint. Basically, what this guy receives unto himself, if you were to go over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 5 and 7, you look at the 5 to 7, you look at the, uh, the, the temptation of Jesus by Satan, you'll find that Jesus is offered all the kingdoms of the world and all of their authorities. He says, I will give it to you. All you got to do is worship me. The devil gives Jesus a shortcut, a way to bypass, a go around the cross. Remember, Satan's always the one that tries to go in the back door, the side way. He's not up front in his dealings. He's not forthright. He's deceptive. What Satan offered Jesus in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 to 7, this guy receives. He takes him up on that offer. Well, now we come to verse 11, and the, the tone of the chapter is going to shift a little bit, because now we encounter a very mysterious character, unlike the Antichrist, who's talked about a lot in Scripture. Cross the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, this guy's got dozens of titles throughout the Bible. It's talked about often in the Psalms, even. But this character here is a little bit more mysterious, a little more enigmatic. He shows up in other places, but um, he, nowhere near as prominent as the Antichrist. In fact, he's the guy lurking in the shadows. We're going to talk about the beast from the earth here. Now, what we're going to encounter in this segment here is what some people view as the third member of an unholy trinity. You could look at Satan or the dragon as being like the father, the beast, or antichrist is much like the son, who reveals the father. You know, the, the, the beast is going to reveal the character of Satan. And then you find a guy who in many ways is going to function like the Holy Spirit. And that's this guy here. Now, it's going to refer to him using, again, symbolic language. It's going to refer to him as a beast. But he's not the same guy that we've been talking about. He's another guy. Make sure you understand the distinction. Okay, and I'm not sure that Daniel even mentions this character. This guy's kind of mysterious. He's in the background. So like Holy Spirit, who does not toot his own horn but points people to Jesus, this guy is going to point people to to the Antichrist. Later in Revelation, it's going to refer to him as the false prophet. Verse 11, Then I saw another beast, another of the same kind in Greek. Another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, some people take this to mean that this guy will be Jewish, he'll be Israeli, ethnically. Uh, I don't necessarily hold that view, but uh, that he comes out of the earth instead of out of the sea, the sea of humanity, is why some people hold that view. I just thought I would mention it as a possibility, but I don't particularly hold that view. I don't think that's necessary to, uh, I don't think it's necessary that uh, he, he be Jewish or Israeli. But he comes up out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Now, I would like to explore that for a moment here, because like the first beast, this second beast is a person. 
We need to understand that. That becomes very clear, by the way, in Revelation 20. Some people tried to make the beast out to be just a government. Some people even have even made him out to be just an ideology. But when we get to Revelation 20, we're going to discover there's, there's a very personal aspect to these two characters. So he is a person. He appears Christ-like. So he's like a lamb in a sense. He's, he's very Christ-like in some ways. But what he says is satanic. He spoke as a dragon. How he speaks is satanic. And so he says he exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist, in his presence. He's kind of like the John the Baptist to the Antichrist. Like John the Baptist was to Jesus, this guy is uh, maybe to the Antichrist. Maybe that's not a great example, but it kind of gives you a sense. He points people toward Jesus. I think a better example is he's more like Holy Spirit. He makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. It says he exercises all the authority of the first beast. So he is often viewed by theologians and Bible prophecy teachers as being like a religious leader. In fact, often people will uh, they'll, they'll make the supposition that this coming uh, influencer, let's call him that, that this coming influencer will be a religious leader, the head perhaps of a major denomination like the Pope. Now, they may make some good points about that, but hold on just a second. I want to just present to you the possibility that while this man does seem to function like a religious leader, he's going to promote worldwide worship of the Antichrist whose fatal wound was healed. While he looks very religious, he may not come from the ranks of the clergy at all. In fact, his role is really to be an influencer. He may arise from a completely unexpected quadrant of society. I would like to submit the possibility this guy could be a major media personality. And not necessarily the news media, but some sort of leading personality that has the gift of influencing people. So he may not, while he functions in a, in a capacity that is religious, he may not look religious. He may not come from a church, okay? So let's let's not get all hung up on or or you know beat up on Catholics about this. Uh, this this may be uh, coming from a completely unexpected direction. It says he performs great signs, miracles, so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. This is something that 2 Thessalonians 2.9 talks about, and it talks about so much, it, it would give us, um, I think it'd be useful to actually look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 for a second here, because these supernatural signs that, have been, that are going to be performed on the earth in this time period are going to give a sense of legitimacy to the Antichrist regime. But the origin of these miracles is Satan. Remember, Satan's agents in Egypt performed miracles in the time of Moses. We need to remember that. In Paul, uh, Paul's statements to the Thessalonian church in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he talks about the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. He's talking about the Antichrist. And he's going to come, and he, his, his coming, his uh, being made apparent to the earth, his unveiling to the earth will be with all power and signs and false wonders. So his rise to power is going to be accompanied by satanic miracles and signs that are going to deceive the world into really believing uh, that, that this is a guy that you want to follow and even worship. It says, And with all deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. And I've talked a lot about this in our series on uh, the Thessalonians, which you can also find on our YouTube channel. And I, I just point out here that one of the things that's really disturbing to me is how this verse seems to suggest that people right now, if you have an opportunity to follow Christ, but you choose for selfish reasons, whatever, to go your own way and just take salvation for granted, that it's always going to be available to you, but then you suddenly die. Or, or that you're suddenly left behind, the rapture happens, and now you find yourself in this time period that, that God's going to somehow excuse that and you're going to be okay. It's all going to work out for you. And the answer is here, um, no. He says there's going to be people who did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. What's going to happen to them? Look at verse 11. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. 
This tells me that people that are left behind who really had an opportunity to follow Jesus, but for selfish reasons, whatever, or they just simply took pleasure in wickedness, they're going to find themselves in a place where they will not have a chance to receive salvation in the future. They're going to be deceived into following the wrong thing. Notice how it says they took pleasure in wickedness. That, that asks, makes me ask the question, wonder what we're taking pleasure in. What are we allowing ourselves to be entertained by? The second beast, it says he performs great signs. He's going to be instrumental in orchestrating a worldwide deception using satanic demonstrations of supernatural power, fake miracles. I mean, the miracles themselves will be genuine, but the effect of those miracles is to get them to follow a fake Messiah. Antichrist means someone who is against Christ, but there's another sense of that to that anti prefix that you need to understand. It also means in place of. This guy comes to replace Christ, but he's, his character is opposed to Christ. Jesus warned, I came in my Father's name, representing him, and you didn't receive me. Another's going to come in his own name, and him you will receive. It's talking about this guy. So there's going to be false miracles that will deceive people into forsaking what the Bible says, into following this leader and his regime. Verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs that was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. Notice he has the wound of a sword. There, there's another detail given here. It means that when this guy receives this fatal head wound, it's not because he had a slip and fall at Wendy's. Okay, the wound of the sword means he dies a violent death. And, and sword can be an idiom for, you know, an instrument of death, not necessarily a bladed instrument. It could be a gunshot wound or something of that nature, but he receives a fatal wound uh, and dies, a, or, or apparently dies a fatal uh, uh, or a violent death. And he comes back to life. And so this is the story, at least that's the storyline that the public follows. And uh, so this guy, he tells everyone to make this image to the beast. Now, I'm going to show you something about the word image. I just want to kind of prepare the way for this. Uh, the word I'm going to show you, it, it meant something different to them back then than it does to us today. But I think that that might actually be intentional by the Holy Spirit. This might be far more specific than John ever imagined it would be. He's, this guy is going to urge, influence the earth to everyone who dwells on the earth to make an image to the beast. Okay, so you want everyone to, to make a statue? Because that's how some people kind of read this. Well, let's look at the word for image. The Greek word for image is the word icon. Now, that means something different to us. It might be so, something so simple as this. You find people all the time urging you to download the app for their company or for that personality's business or whatever. Maybe through some, some form of technology, there's an, something like an app, and you download the icon for that, and somehow you're able to interact with the leader in a personal way. That's one, um, I'm just kind of trying to present a, a possible way that this could look. Okay? The technology that we currently have allows for something like this, but I think that we're dealing with something that's a technology step beyond what we have right now. Remember, technology is growing so much that what we have right now is obsolete in a year, okay? What we're dealing with here might be something of a technology statement, and I just want you to be thinking along those terms. Icon meant something different to us in our day than it did in John's day, but that might be intentional. It says it was given to him, it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast. To be killed. Notice he makes the image of the beast, he renders it lifelike. It can speak and it can cause, if you don't worship it, it can cause your death. So this image is given some kind of power here. Now, breath is pneuma in the Greek and it's, it has a wide range of uses. It's used to express uh, the idea of breath, you know, as, as you're breathing through your mouth uh, or, or the wind can be used in that sense. It's also the word for spirit, but the sense in which it's used here implies that he renders, he, he's given the ability to make this image become very lifelike. Now, in John's day, they had people build a statue uh, or an image to a god that they were going to worship, whether it was the emperor or some mythological deity, 
And sometimes it would be hollow, sometimes it's solid, but there would be an actor or a ventriloquist in the room who would basically, and many times under the influence of a spirit, like what you see in Acts chapter 16, a spirit-possessed person who, under the influence of demonic powers, speaks utterances on behalf of this God. So when someone came in to worship this idol or this deity, they had an experience that was very lifelike. It was almost like this thing really was alive and really did talk to them. Okay, this is how things worked in John's day. We might see something like that using technology in our day or even in the, uh, the near future. And I think that's what we're dealing with here. I think we're dealing with something that is uh, perhaps a piece of high tech. So in some way, this icon of the beast, this image of the beast, is animated or rendered lifelike. It's able to speak. And somehow it's able to enforce worship under pain of death. We don't know how that's going to work, whether the app itself or the image itself actually kills you or just reports you to the authorities. We don't know. But in some way, it's able to enforce worship under pain of death. Verse 16, And he causes all, the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the freemen, the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. He causes all to be given a mark on the right hand or on their forehead. Now, of all the things the Bible has to say about this particular time period, this is the one thing that everyone seems to know about. There's people that don't know much of anything about the Bible, but they've heard of the mark of the beast and they have some kind of idea of what that might be. So what I want to do is I want to take just a couple minutes here as we get close to closing in this, this message out. Uh, I want to clear up a few things because a lot of Christians have a very confused understanding about this mark of the beast. And most Christians have a very small, they have almost no understanding of the image of the beast. Everyone seems to know about the mark of the beast, but no one seems to understand the image of the beast. There's two things in play here. Okay, this, this image of the beast seems to be something that's high-tech, lifelike. You are able to have some kind of personal interaction with this world leader. The mark of the beast is what everyone thinks they know about, but because of some misunderstandings, um, they can end up having some pretty weird and irrational views. So I want to just take a look at what the Bible says and maybe clear up some of this so we can steer clear of weird and irrational fears. It says the mark is on the right hand or on the forehead. Say on. It doesn't say in. The Greek word is epi. It means on. If it meant in, it would have said en, which means in in Greek. Now it says on the surface of the forehead or on the surface of the hand. It's applied to the surface. It's not subsurface. It's topical. Think about it. If everyone seems to think that this is a microchip and it gets injected under the skin, and you know, because they're using that in dogs and cats and you know, special forces and things like that. Hold on a second. Not everybody can receive that. Some bodies will reject an implant of that uh, of some kind. So you know, universal application does not necessarily work with microchips. And furthermore, that technology is obsolete already. Most Christians that are talking about. They've been talking about it for thirty years. The technology is obsolete. Okay, let's just set that aside for a second. Also, think about this. They, they say they're, they're afraid that they're going to have to go in the store and, you know, get their hand scanned or their forehead scanned, you know, to make their purchases and stuff. In them. And uh, hold on a second. If you're going to enforce the worship of this guy, wouldn't it be easier just to say, hey, show me your hand or forehead? I mean, wouldn't it be easier just to look and with our eyes just be able to see if somebody had the mark on their hand or their forehead? I mean, that to me, that seems easier than you know, scanners and things like that. So I, I really, um, I, I don't think that this is something that is an implant or is injected under the skin. I don't believe it has anything to do with subsurface. It's on the surface of the skin. It's not a vaccine. It's not medicine. Okay. It's none of the things that people are rationally afraid of. There's people that are afraid of debit cards because of this whole business. That brings us to another issue. It says the mark contains either the name or the number of the beast. And so some people are really afraid of personal identification numbers, like PIN numbers and things of that nature, social security numbers even. People are you know, freaked out about that. Well, the point is, the mark that you receive on their forehead or on their hand, it's not your number, it's his number. That's really important to understand. 
It's his number. It's not your identification number. Rather, it identifies you with this world leader. See, the bearers of the mark, somehow they are identifying with this antichrist, this ruler, this leader, who, ha who was dead but came back to life. They're identifying with him in some kind of worshipful way. Why the hand and the forehead? It may be a parody of something that God has done throughout Scripture, like in a spiritual sense, but this is clearly in the physical uh, realm that they're doing this. So we'll explore a little bit more of that next time. But the bearers of the mark are identifying with this Antichrist in some worshipful way, and that's really the key to what's going on here. Verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for his number of a man and his number is 666. All right, let's explore the 666 and we'll wrap this up here. This is another area where there's all kinds of widespread um, ideas, conjectures. Some of them are, are, are actually useful and then some of them are really off the wall. Uh, I remember watching a lengthy video that showed, demonstrated that monster beverages were, you know, had the mark of the beast in 666. And I'll, I'll show you one more that you can add to your menu of, oh, that freaks me out. <laughs> but let's just explore this really quickly. The number 666, what is this all about? Turns out there's several languages where the letters also carry a numeric value. Greek and Hebrew are two of those languages, and those are the two languages, principally, the languages of the Bible. Hebrew being the Old Testament, Greek being the New Testament. Also in English, are there English language letters that are also numbers that carry a numeric value? Yes, turns out there are some in the using Roman numerals, the, the letter I represents one, a V is five, X is uh, 10, uh, what is L? I think L is uh, 50, C is 100, M I think is 500. And just to really freak you out, if you add up all those numbers, guess what you end up with? <laughs> 666. So you can play around with that. Remember, this final kingdom has something to do with the old Roman Empire, so I, you know, I, I wouldn't totally throw that away. All right, Greek and Hebrew, every letter has a numeric value. So I believe that when this world leader is revealed, okay, when he is revealed to, uh, and, and, and what's really going to reveal him is some actions he takes in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem about the midpoint of this seven-year period. And Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, um, Revelation 11 talks about this. Jesus mentions it in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and elsewhere. That's really what reveals the Antichrist to be the Antichrist. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about it. But when this person is revealed, another way you can cross-check it is that his name, the numeric value of his name, the combined letters of his name, will amount to this peculiar value of 666. That is one of the conjectures. I, I think that that is a, a reasonable way of interpreting what he's talking about here. For example, my name, the number of my first name, Joel, is easy to, to discover because it is a Jewish name. Joel is, the, the numeric value, if I recall correctly, is 47. Okay. I don't recall what my last name is. That one I have to kind of fudge a little bit because it's a Gentile last name. But the, the point is, is you can take characters and try to, you know, put their, their characters into, uh, or their names into Greek or Hebrew and try to figure out what the numeric value is of it. And there's a whole thing behind this. It can get really strange really fast. And I don't think it's a fruitful exercise to try to figure out, you know, is, uh, is Biden the Antichrist? Is, was Trump the Antichrist? You know, people thought Obama was the Antichrist. I don't think he's going to be American, y'all. So, I mean, Southern Europe, Middle East, that's where I would be looking if I was looking. But the point is, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says he can't even be revealed until a restraining influence is removed. And I believe as long as the church is on the earth, that restraining influence is in play. So uh, it's, it's really a fruitless uh, exercise. Now, there is something interesting about this 666 I thought I'd show you just to really muddy the waters before we wrap this up. I noticed Google changed its logo not that long ago, and uh, what caught my attention is this logo in its black and white, in its two-tone form that I find on my uh, web browser. 
uh, when you expand a tab, I, I see that. I'm like, man, that looks familiar. Where have I seen that before? And it took me several weeks before I remembered. Back in the early 2000s when I did this exhaustive study of this character called the Antichrist, uh, I did a multi-week presentation at my church, you know, teaching on this and what does the Bible say from Genesis to Revelation about this guy. And uh, and what, just for grins at one point, I think for, for an artistic effect, I just demonstrated a way that the mark could look where it ne doesn't necessarily look sinister. Okay, Usually we see 666, it looks sinister. Well, here's a way that it maybe it doesn't look sinister, and I portrayed it as a circle, like a six, and then another six laid on top of it, and then a third six laid on top of it, and I, I spread them out at equidistant intervals, so it's, it looked like a circle with three spikes coming out from it. Something like this. In fact, almost exactly like this. So, is Google the mark of the beast? <laughs> Probably not. Now, there's a lot of people that were afraid afraid of Apple because it's you know it's the apple of, uh, from the Garden of Eden that, and it's the woman that took the bite out of the, the fruit she wasn't supposed to eat. And so I'm not going to buy Apple because of that. Well, I'll throw this one out at you just to freak you out. So you want to stay away from that Google phone now too. Of course, I could also argue that that's also 999. It depends on how you look at it. So the reason I show you that is I wanted to show you how this might not look sinister. I wanted to show you how this can be viewed as something quite um, innocent in appearance. So clearly many people are going to be deceived by this. One last thing about 666, is it is notable in this way that 6 is kind of the number of man. It's a humanistic number. Man being created on the sixth day, we fall short of seven, which is like a, a spiritual perfection point. Uh, falling short of that, we won't attain to, to seven. We're at six. The number three is linked to God, who is three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so the number six in triplicate is maybe another expression of man, humans, trying, as the serpent said in the garden, you will be as God. Six and triplicate could be viewed as man trying to be God, which is another, I think, very valid sense of well, what does this mean here in Revelation 13. So there we go, Revelation 13. Well, there's some interesting things here for sure, but you know, what is God saying to us in this? And something I tried to I tried to highlight it as we go, but I want to come back to. Even though there's, there's so many interesting things happening in this in this final 42 months before the return of Jesus. We could focus on so many different themes. We could focus on, you know, how the character of Antichrist is, you, you can contrast, like, what he does and contrast it with Jesus, and in so doing, learn things about Jesus. And so even chapters like this will, will reveal Jesus for who he really is and what he's done. And so we could, we could do that, but what stands out to me most in this, this chapter is that worship matters. Worship matters. Satan's got limited resources. We, we explored that last week, and especially in these final 42 months. He's, now he's even more limited in his resources. How does he apply those resources? It goes into worship. That tells me something. Worship matters. Who or what we give our worth to, that's what worship means. Worth, ship, to transfer my worth unto something. That's what worship is. Worship matters. Look at nearly all the heavenly scenes in Revelation and what you discover there, among other things, are authentic expressions of worship. Heavenly worship isn't misdirected. Heavenly worship isn't misused. Quite often, we end up misusing it on platforms or in churches. What we call worship, a lot of times, is nothing more than entertainment. And unfortunately, the worshipers as worshipers, we, we can receive unto us what we're meant to direct heavenward, what we're meant to give to God. Worship matters. One of the things I learned in, in the Psalm 115, I think it's in Psalm 137 as well, in Psalm 115 verse 8, it says that in effect that we become like what we worship. Our character is shaped by worship. Worship is character forming. Think about this. One thing that Revelation shows us is that everyone ultimately will be worshiping something, and who or what we worship matters. If I don't like something that's showing up in my life, I don't like something that's showing up in the character, in my core, who I really am. If, if there's something showing up in my life I don't like, I, I need to examine what am I giving my worth 
to? What am I giving my time, my treasure, and my talent unto? Think about that. What we do with our money, what we do with our time, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, and how we spend our God-given gifts, our talents. What or who are we giving our worth to? Worship is character forming. And what we find on the earth in this time period is people worshiping the wrong thing and it's rapidly corroding their character. To the point when you get to the end of these 42 months, people will take on the irrational response to Jesus' return of actually fighting against him. Think about that. Worship matters. What are you giving yourself unto? Maybe this is something that we need to correct. And we can do it today. We can just say, God, I recognize how I'm spending my time, my money, my talents. It's character forming. And I don't like what's showing up in my life. I need you to shape my life. I want to redirect my worship to you. We can make that decision today because where we spend eternity can be directly linked to who we worship. Well, we're going to pray in just a second here, but what I want you to do before next time, before our next uh, uh, broadcast, get together with someone, go over the discussion questions in your notes. Again, you can download those from the, the link provided in the description to this video. Also, read Revelation chapter 14. That's where we're heading next week. And then compare some things from Matthew's gospel, Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. Uh, compare what you find there. Compare what it says um, with what, uh, what Jesus is saying in Matthew 13. Compare that to what you're going to find in Revelation chapter 14. That might be some uh, useful exercise to prepare the way for what we're going to talk about next time. But if God's speaking to your heart today, let's deal with this matter of worship, how we spend our time, our talent, our treasure. And usually what we end up spending on are the three S's, sex, stuff, and status. Those are the three things that really drag our character down. How many times maybe are we going after what is meant to be directed unto God? How many times do we maybe engage in something that's more satanic than we realize? Attention-seeking, recognition-seeking, wanting people to worship us. It's subtle how it can sneak into our lives, but when it takes a hold of us, it's corrosive to our character. We can turn that around with this gift that is available in this time that we're in right now. This time right now, we have grace and we can repent. We can say, God, I want, to, I want my character to shift the other direction. I want you to show me how I can spend my time, my treasure, and my talent in a good way. How can I redirect worship back to you? Let's explore that together, shall we? Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray everyone watching this video, Lord, I pray that you would show us how we might become true worshipers, how we might redirect our worth unto you. You gave us the breath of life. How might we respond adequately to you? How might we respond with what you've entrusted to our care, our time, our talent, our money, our treasure? How might we redirect that back to you? I pray that you would show us that, and I pray that our character would begin to shift in a Christ-like direction. Lord, we, we just look to you, King Jesus. Be the king of our life, that we might see you for who you really are. Lord, I pray that that would be the reality for everyone watching this video. May we grow in grace and in knowledge of who Jesus is. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his goodness to rest upon your life. May he who is able to keep you from stumbling be with you all. We'll see you back here next time. You take care, and God bless.